very warm welcome to all our participants joining us as we stream from a cold but thankfully post winter solstice day here in Johannesburg. Um, I see we have about 67 people on board. We're expecting close on to 250 folk joining us today. So I'm not too sure whether we should just give them a minute or so. Thank you, colleagues. Um, I've posted the link to yesterday's plenary session. It's in the chat. Please do have a look and please note that today's session is also being streamed live. We will be posting the link there shortly. I think people are still coming through, so we'll just give them a minute. I think I'm going to continue talking and I'm sure, um, yeah, I'm sure that the other participants will be joining us shortly. We do have a very short session this morning. We need to promptly stop at about 10 o'clock because we have the concurrent sessions starting thereafter. Okay, once again, colleagues, my name is Fatima Rahim and I'm a program specialist in learning technologies at SADI, but I'm also responsible for the communications portfolio of the Siapu Malela program. I'm very honored to be presenting this session, which is always a highlight of our conference as we showcase the wonderful work of our partners. As you may have heard in yesterday's session in Jenny Glenny's presentation, our partners, the initial seven institutions, which constitute DUT, UW, UWC, UFS, BITS, UCT, UKZ, and NMU, they all play a leading role in the development of new tools for their own institutions and for the broader higher ed system. They also lead and support the regional network and they provide services. Talking about yesterday's session, we had some glitches in streaming the live service. We do apologize for that, but I have posted the link in the chat. So all the plenary sessions will be available now on YouTube. Um, and with this one currently being live streamed, I've also placed the link for that session in the chat. Um, it is now five past nine, and I need to hand over to my colleague, Gudeja Parker, fondly known as Cool to all of us. She is the CI institutional researcher at DUT and also the lead project driver. Um, uh, Ku, are you around? Hello, Fatima. Yes, I'm here. Uh, okay, so Ku will present for about 20 minutes, after which we can address any questions you may have to her. You can either place that in the chat or you can raise your hand using the Zoom feature in the reaction tab below. Um, okay, cool. can I hand over to you? Yeah, th thanks so much, Fatima. It's really just to say uh, good morning to everyone and really to convey um, our Deputy Vice Chancellor Teaching and Learning Prof. Sibia's warm greetings and her apologies that uh, she could not join us online today. She has, however, prepared a video and uh, I think uh, your tech team, Pia, is going to help to, to actually uh, stream that video. So we will begin with a video from um, gre greetings from Professor Sibia, followed by our partner presentation video uh, colleagues. Thank you so much. Thank, you. Thank cool. you, Program Director. I bring with me warm greetings from the Devon University of Technology. I am Nogutula Sibia, the Deputy Vice Chancellor teaching and learning, and Sepumelela project leader at the university. Our presentation entitled, Success Beyond the Classroom, Developing Adaptive Graduates at DUT, will showcase how Sepumelela is aligned to and embedded in our DUT strategic plan, known as Envision 2030. The Envision 2030 seeks ultimately to improve lives and livelihoods, both within our DUT community and the broader society. It is scaffolded on four perspectives, which are stewardship, systems and processes, sustainability and society. Each perspective is founded upon three strategic objectives. Here you just see one of the three strategic objectives for each perspective. Live values, innovative curricula, a distinctive education, and adaptive graduates. 
This second phase of Sepmulela project at DUT addresses the four biggest student challenges we currently face, and these include financial and food insecurity, disjointed university support systems and processes, different levels of preparedness of our students, and the fourth student success challenge relates to building an institution-wide culture of evidence-based decision-making. We address these challenges through our three focus areas, namely holistic student support known as Sibusagele, we've got you, moving the middle known as Hambisa, and building evidence-led institutional culture. Three focus areas of Sigusegele that address the first and second challenges include Food Security Forum, One Residence, One Garden, Pagimpilo, which addresses food nutrition and education, Student Wellness Care, where we facilitate webinars on mental health and disability, Student Training and Development, which consists of Wunder Leadership, Academy, Financial Literacy, newsletter to update students on financial aid. Our third major student success challenge relates to different levels of preparedness of our students to become the creative, adaptive, and entrepreneurial graduates envisioned in our strategic plan. Our staff are also different, differently abled um, in terms of the skills and pedagogies needed to effectively guide and develop our students into adaptive graduates. A new dynamic is the shift to remote learning as a result of COVID-19 and the digital divide that most of our students and some staff experience in terms of data, connectivity, devices, and technical know-how. These challenges are being addressed through focus area two, Hambisa, meaning moving the middle. The middle are students, uh, are those who are at risk of not completing even in extra time uh, who are then at very high risk of dropping out if they are not eligible for NESFAS funding. Lastly, the fourth student success challenge relates to building an institution-wide culture of evidence-based decision-making. These are pockets of excellence in terms of using data effectively to inform, monitor, and evaluate. We aim to achieve a lived evidence-based culture that is entrenched across the university. Through the third focus area, building an evidence-led institutional culture, we implement Autoscholar, which is the software for tracking of students and staff performance, a power heater, our data warehouse, and we conduct a number of surveys, including student satisfaction surveys. And lastly, the focus is on capacity building of staff, which includes training on Power BI, Excel, and qualitative research. Ladies and gentlemen, the team will share briefly the details of these exciting projects that we are involved with. I thank you. Hello everyone. My name is Ku Parker. I am the Sia Pumalela Institutional Researcher at DUT and the Lead Project Driver. The theme of our presentation today reflects our understanding of student success as far more than academic success. Having creative, innovative, entrepreneurial and adaptive graduates who can help change the world is the key intent of DUT's strategy and vision for the next 10 years. Our work in building and refining our understanding of what it takes to be an adaptive graduate goes back over 10 years with the university's final graduate attributes document approved at Senate in 2014. As you see here, the five DUT graduate attributes encompass independent and critical thinking, creativity, teamwork and communication skills, sociocultural and environmental awareness, as well as academic or discipline-specific knowledge. The video you are about to see comprises various DUT students and staff speaking about their involvement in co-curricular activities that contribute to developing these DUT graduate attributes and adaptive graduates. These are Makaza Ladies Network, Vuna Leadership Academy, the Student Business Festival, One Residence, One Garden, and Vibrant Campuses. Enjoy! Greetings colleagues and to all our conference attendees. My name is Teliwe Kremanenyati. I'm the head of the department in student housing and res life in the Midlands campus. 
I'm here today to share and to talk to you about the Kagaza Ladies Network that was formed in the year 2013. So DUT, under Student Housing, a division of student services, created this safe space where all women are gathering together, whether you are in, on campus or you are a resident student, together with the residence advisors and Obvious, there is life development officers and other uh, fellow colleagues. They come together. They are they are able to engage with our young women, trying to check what is it that they, that is of concern, and also coming up with uh, exciting and educational programs that will be able to assist, develop, and teach our young girls. Also, to boost the confidence and and obviously teach how to be independent as a woman and how to best face the challenges that are that are surrounding us the challenges that we normally face in the society on campus and around the world so thank you so much colleagues for tuning in and thank you for showing interest in our kakaza ladies network thank you so much Greetings everyone, my name is Nozibusi Sokumal and I am currently doing my advanced diploma in business administration. The program or structure that I'd like to tell you more about is Kagaza Ladies Network, which when loosely translated, Kagaza means blooming. Hence why we want women in this institution to bloom into their higher selves and become a person who understands their identity within a social sphere that is large. So, what is my contribution towards this program? My contribution towards this program is the, the former chairperson or chair lady of Colors and Ladies Network, of which my main goal was to basically to plan, organize, lead and control the structure towards its organizational goals and also to ensure that the team works together collaboratively in ensuring that the program actually works and is quite influential so what i have gained i've learned a lot through these programs because i've learned that it is important to balance your social life and your academic life and that you're not an island as a person and you actually do need people and you don't work alone as a human. So what I've also learned is the idea of sisterhood and being a unit as women and the importance of actually empowering yourself and growing as a woman. And with that being said, thank you. Greetings. The Vona Leadership Academy is a part of Sigo Segele. We've got you. It is a collaborative program between student governance and development, student housing and residence life, sports administration, and health. The Academy strives to be a premier space for training, research, reflection, and reservoir of knowledge pertaining to leadership practice and studies for young leaders. It aims to infuse the values and principles of the university among students and also contribute towards developing a common duty culture. The Academy also aims to ensure that our leaders become creative thinkers, ethical leaders, and also equip them with skills on how to be better leaders in the 21st century. I thank you. Greetings, my name is Aonge Gufa um, and I'm currently doing my Postgraduate diploma in public administration, public management. Um, as the former SRSA of 2020 2021, I have been involved in quite a few of the institutional programs, which are namely uh, First Year Orientation 2021, Student Business Festival, um, InnoBiz Launch, your Instagrams Network, Vuna Leadership Academy. One of which that I believe has stood up. Uh, a lot in in terms of impact and 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 and, and, and many other aspects to the students uh, of the institution is Vuna Leadership Academy. Vuna Leadership Academy is one of the programs and projects that bring about change and development within the student leadership community and within the student the student holistically. This program is a program that aims to develop a mindset of a leader and how it polishes the vision of a leader and how it makes or teaches 
a leader on how to go about in daily uh, routines of a leader on how to make a decision on how to think um, thoroughly on, 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 on whatever situation um, this program is a program that I believe most institutions should have because it develops the mindsets of the student community of the institution it brings about positive change in one's mindset in one's spiritual uh, concept and in one's critical you know thinking it is a program that has brought change in me personally because it helped it has helped me uh, to identify on, on 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 what kind of a leader that i am and what is it that as a leader i should aspire to and, and i believe that it is bringing about positive change in the leadership of students The Business Festival is an integral of the Sikusekele We've Got You Holistic Student Support Initiative. It is as a response to a call made by our Vice Chancellor to deliberately inculcate a culture of entrepreneurship amongst our students. The program is embedded on Envision 2030 and particularly the society perspective which speaks of entrepreneurship and innovation, but also adaptive graduates. In the year 2021, DUT hosted its first ever online business festival. And of course, this was a platform where students showcased all kinds of businesses they actually are involved in, particularly with one short-term goal of making sure that we showcase and celebrate the ways in which students are creating their streams of income. The other component of the festival is that of education around entrepreneurship, where we invite well-esteemed entrepreneurs and CEOs of big companies to come and actually advise our students on how they can sustainably establish their own businesses and how then they can advance not only South Africa, but also the world at large using their own innovative ways. Greetings to you all. My name is Sipelian Pele. I am a third year homeopathy student here at Durban University of Technology. I was privileged enough last year to be part of a program that is called the Business Festival. This program was created by the Durban University of Technology to help young entrepreneurs like myself. This project aimed at helping students who are interested in business, grow and be successful in whatever business venture they may have. And because of this, this project became very dear and important to me because that's exactly what I needed. That's exactly what I wanted as a young entrepreneur. I wanted my business to grow. I wanted it to be successful. Hence, I was compelled and eager to join. So basically what we did at the festival was go for a photo shoot and in that photo shoot we're explaining what products we have, what we sell, what we bring to the clients and that was taken and given to D2 students and in that way we were marketing our products. So from this experience I was able to gain a lot of clients which I'm very grateful for. I was also able to network with other entrepreneurs which it's very, very important when you are in business. I learned how to be committed. I learned how to be professional to ensure that um, I take accountability for my actions. Um, ensure that whatever I deliver it is the best of my ability. Um, I also ensure that I know how to solve a problem. And because of that, I believe that when I graduate, I'm going to be an adaptive graduate and I will be aligned with the Inversion 2030. Thank you so much. Good day. My name is Kosi Twala and I oversee the Green Campus Initiative, which is a student-led initiative. Today I'll be talking about the One Residence, One Garden project, which is currently being run across DUT residences, both on campus as well as the least residences. By 
putting students at the center of resolving their own challenges. This project seeks to alleviate food scarcity and hunger among students, responding directly to the uneven economic growth, poverty, and food scarcity. The project is aimed at improving nutritional levels and livelihoods by giving students the ability to produce healthy foods for consumption and the sale of surplus crops. By using innovative ways to establish gardens which are not limited to traditional gardening methods, the One Residence One Garden Projects allows students to develop into adaptive graduates and critical thinkers as they are adaptive to environmental and developmental challenges that they experience. Students are able to enact knowledge from mainstream curricula into co-curricular programs such as the One Residence One Garden Project, which allows for the full realization and demonstration of the DET graduate attributes as well as Envision 2030. Thank you. My name is Vashe Lamine, a third year student studying towards a diploma in business and information management. I am currently part of the Green Campus Initiative. GCI has played a huge role in student de development, including my personal development. If you give a man fish, he will eat for a day. But if you teach men how to fish, he will have food for a lifetime. This analogy can also be applied when speaking to programs such as One Resident, One Garden. One resident, one garden does not only tackle the issue of food security, but it also provides students with skills that can enable them to sustain themselves in the future. I currently serve as a mentor to the new executive team where I give guidance and also partake in their projects. In the previous year, I served as a chairperson. I championed the one garden, one resident, the green in Daba, where I sat on the panel, and community outreach programs. My duties included ideation, planning, implementation, and reporting back to the Department of Student Housing. In my experience within GCI, I have attained strong leadership skills and communication skills. GCI has also afforded me the opportunity to network with other green champions. It also has allowed me to cultivate my agricultural skills, where I infuse traditional agriculture with the 21st century living, the use of vertical garden in living spaces. My name is Bonisa Ngobo, a master student from the Department of Food and Nutrition. My name is Tebo, a final year student from the Department of Chemical Engineering. Me and Boniso are from a project called Vibrant Campuses, which currently has five members. Vibrant Campuses is a food nutrition program that was designed and developed by student for students as part of food security project of Siapa Melela at DUT. This program was designed to respond to food insecurity challenges currently facing universities, including solving nutritional gaps and need through improved food access and quality. Moreover, we educate, train and inform students. For example, we do food and nutrition education programs, food demonstration programs and food awareness programs. That means our program do not only address food insecurity, but it also serves as a means to improve campus food environment, student food choice and consumption of healthier foods. My involvement in the project is that I act as a bridge between the public and the project, whereby I try to bring awareness to the public of what the project is all about. For example, I connect various stakeholders with the project, like the SRC, One Rest One Garden, and various community projects who do gardens around Devon. My personal experience as a team leader of Vibrant Campuses and also as a member of Sierra Pomelela Student Success Team at DU Team is how this project has developed my leadership skills as I get involved with um, different people from different departments. By saying different people, I refer to being involved with lectures in discussions and also being involved with uh, my peers in also discussion. So our involvement has grown me in, into become a critical thinker. For example, we work with different people from different departments which bring different perspective to what we do as a team and it also helps to look at things from different sides of the cone. And another example, it could be how Siapa Melela ideas such as the importance of using data to solve problems has really impacted our program. Everything that we do in our program, it's always 
based on an evidence. Everything that we can show to you, it's based on an evidence. Thank you very much for that, Ku. Um, I, that was, it was an excellent presentation, certainly visionary, talking about Envision 2030 and, and an interesting and diverse array of student interventions. Thank you so much for sharing that. Are there any questions, colleagues? Certainly a very inspiring yes. presentation. Please feel free to put your hands up if you'd like to ask a question or post a question in the chat. I've got a, a question Dorothy. from a question from Polite. Polite, would you like to go ahead? Uh, morning. Uh, thank you for the beautiful presentation. I've got a question. My question relates to the program that targets women and girls in general. My question is, is there a program, a similar program for, for males? I'm thinking in terms of, if you look at uh, the GBV uh, sketch in South Africa, it seems we are leaving out males in terms of uh, empowering them, especially when, when it comes to issues around GBV. Is there a program that you're running that's along similar lines to the one that you're doing for, for women? Hi, um, yes, Fatima, thank you so much for your question as well, uh, Polite. There is a, a similar um, academy, if I can call it that, it's called the Insika Men's Network, um, similar to the one that we have for ladies in Gaza. And then of course the Vuna leadership is open to, you know, um, irrespective of gender. So yes, we do have a similar, uh, you know, we've our, both our students and our staff involved have been having a, some prop ch challenges joining us this morning. So I'm not sure who's actually in the, uh, in the room with us, but uh, if there are any other DUT staff here who can speak um, to the uh, Zika Men's uh, Network, please please come through. Mzwa, you might be able to contribute. Um, hi, Doc. Yes. Um, so basically, the Zika Men's Network and also the Tagaza Men's uh, Ladies Network, they somehow do similar work, particularly around uh, uh, students and, and hunting each other and really uh, sort of creating a peer-to-peer -peer kind of support network um, where then they discuss uh, an array of issues really uh, ranging from social coercion to men or women empowerment and also um, assisting, each, uh, assisting each other academically as well. But then also um, towards the end of the year, we then kind of bring the two programs together and they discuss um, different kinds of issues that are affecting both men and women. Um, one of the programs that we have done recently, um, which kind of links with the Green Campus Initiative as well, um, we did what we call a dark hour sort of program where students gathered in one residence and we switched off all the lights in that particular rest and trying to, of course, educate students to um, save on light and whatsoever, but the discussions that we had in that dark hour, they were really around, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, gender-based violence and many other issues that actually students are facing. So there is one program that is for the male students, which is Intiga, and we have one program which is for the females, which will be Kagaza, that we actually spotlighted today. And then there's one that is still developing uh, which is particularly for the LGBTQIA plus uh, community as well. Um, so we kind of are starting that program and it's developing and there's many other students who are interested then in also joining that program. But really the idea is to make sure that we do all the kinds of developments, but we bring the students together as well to discuss um, sort of issues that are affecting them uh, in whichever level that they are doing so. so Yes, thanks. Okay, thank you. Um, there's a question in the chat. 
do you have a centralized space or platform where you bring these networks or programs together? And that's from Melvin. Cool. Would you like to answer that? I think, yes, I think this happens through the uh, student housing networks. Uh, so as far as I'm aware, uh, I'm not directly involved in these programs, but as far as I'm aware, and as um, Zwa, I think, was just uh, speaking that towards the end of the year, they do actually bring uh, the different networks together. But I think during the course of the year, there is a lot of networking and sharing between the, um, the, the two male, male, male and female networks. Great. Thank you. Any other questions, colleagues? Okay, I think we're going to go over now to the next coastal province and introduce uh, Professor Sue Partha from UWC. She's the Associate Professor in teaching and, uh, the Teaching and Learning Specialist, and she'll be talking to data-informed actions to support year two of Pumelela at UWC. Professor Sue, over to you. Thank you, Fatima. Good morning, colleagues. Um, thank you for joining this session. I think we're going to start off first with uh, three presentations. And uh, the first is a video by our DVC academic. Uh, she's unable to join, but will join later in the day today. Uh, just giving you a brief uh, outline of year one and year two of uh, Pumalela at UWC initiatives. And then we have reflections from our students. We have two student videos. The first student video actually looks at uh, a student who is a first generation student. His name is Shadeen. And Shadeen talks, reflects on his journey on how he became a UWC student. The second video actually showcases uh, students from the mentorship program. Uh, both mentors and mentees and how they uh, connected with each other during the COVID period. And finally, then I would build on year one Pumalela activities uh, with you. So I'm going to hand over to Elizabeth. I'm Babian Levak, Deputy Vice Chancellor Academic at UWC. Today I will be sharing with you the successes, the challenges, and the way forward for us um, in, in our project called Pumalela at UWC. Our successes include the establishment of the Student Success Subcommittee, which is a part of our Senate Academic Planning Committee, which I chair. Here we address all student success related activities. We have representation from across faculties, units, and student voices and representation. Sia Pumalela has provided UWC with a space to work more collaboratively, and much of the student success interventions were active before, but operated individually or in silos. The Pumalela project has allowed us to bring all engagements under one umbrella. Funding from the project has allowed for more capacity in the core areas. Data analysts and researchers. The DAWG, this is the Data Analytics Working Group, was established and the team meets every second Friday and has representation from across the institution. Their focus is on creating a central data warehouse. We ran a very successful campaign to make staff aware of the value of the Institutional Capacity Assessment Tool, or ICAT, and we had an ex excellent response rate. 38% of our staff participated in the ICAT survey, the largest response rate amongst the partner institutions in South Africa. The Capacity Cafe workshops with staff created a discussion space for us and the ICAT CC process highlighted several important issues that were taken into consideration for our year two of implementation. It also allowed us to make adjustments to our initial focus areas. 
Working remotely is still one of our biggest challenges, especially with engaging with students and implementing our student success initiatives. So what's our way forward for 2022? Firstly, to update our action plan aligned with our goals from the data collected. Secondly, to prioritize holistic interventions. Here we have the data from the BUSI, the first year expectation and experience surveys and feedback surveys from the transition program. These indicate the need to focus on mental health and well-being. We have prioritized this focus area for 2022. We will work across units. First year mentors will be trained by two units from the DVC SDS and DVC Academic to provide the skills to peer mentors to engage with our students as a first respondent when they are confronted with first year students that experience mental health and well-being issues. Our student success project will be framed with the activity theory system and analyzed accordingly from implementation to monitoring and evaluation. Finally, we will follow a phased approach to our goals while taking time to reflect together or collectively on the process. Good morning, my name is Sharon Ayers and this is my story. I attended Hillside Primary and then Spine Rurai and I'm currently at UWC. Growing up I always knew I was different and wanted more out of life. I grew up in Rocklands Mitchell's Plain. There were not a lot of opportunities around me unless I went to go look for it. And growing up, I was always seen as different because I was part of the LGBT community. So I got picked on a lot. I was name called, etc. I started volunteering and was part of a volunteer program, which sort of supported me and uplifted me and sort of told me there's more to life than the border, than what's inside of the borders of Mitchell's Plain. I went to Spanarai, was the first one to pass matric with exceptionally well marks and decided to further my studies at university. I'm studying a teaching degree. I'm currently studying a teaching degree and I am in my second year. In my first year, I knew that the transition from high school to university was going to be difficult and other than the support I received from my family and my peers, I knew I needed further help, which is why I decided to look for help. I got a mentor with a first year, ex first year experience program, which sort of helped me a lot. My mentor helped me with time management, stress management, as well as how to work on a budget seeing that I'm getting my own money in paid into my bank account, feeling like an adult, so to say. And I knew that being in a being a first year student is one of the most difficult things to do. And this is what led me to become a mentor. So being a mentor is a full time job and it's also a very fulfilling job. Although you do get a allowance for doing it. It's not just about the money. Helping others is such an enrichment, enriching experience that you feel so fulfilled when you are actually helping others. When speaking or helping my first year students as a mentor, it feels amazing because I knew the support I needed in my first year is exactly what these students need right now and helping them is an amazing experience and being a part of this program also helps me as it teaches me to become more responsible and it also gives me another support system. The, the support I receive from my first year transition officer is amazing. She's always there when I need her, when I need advice or when I need someone to speak to, she's available. She's hands on. She really helped me through my second year. 
although I had a mentor in my first year and she was amazing, what the support I received from this program is exceptional. I think that the motivation I received from this program is what helped me succeed in my first year and is what will help me succeed in my second year. So this is also what led me, this is also another factor that led me to become a mentor, is supporting others. I know that you need a lot of support in your first year and I want to be that support for others. And getting more people to be a part of this program is very important to me because I know there are students out there with the same problems as me and if I can help their un I can help them with their university experience it might help me and it might be a amazing opportunity for the first year students to succeed thank you so much for listening Hi guys, my name is Colette and I am a mentor for the FYTP. Being a mentor in this time was quite challenging because you have to interact with people virtually, which is more difficult than it is to interact with people physically. But the program did make it very easy, made resources available for us to be able to help first years transition into university accordingly. One of the biggest challenges that I faced personally with online sessions was getting my mentees to open up. But you know, with time, with patience and persistence, we got there. I do strongly encourage people to join the FYTP program. Thank you. I'd just like to share some of my experience so far with the program. Uh, it's been challenging, but exciting. It's really been exciting and a huge learning curve for me. Um, especially given that we are working online during the pandemic we tend to feel isolated and disconnected from the university and the community um, this is program has really brought it together to address issues and um, help our peers uh, like this mentoring um the fytp uh, program i feel like that's such an important an important program because it has given these mentees the the community that most of us get when we go into varsity. I'm Bongani and last year I was doing my first year and also part of the program. I love and appreciate the work that was done, the support that I got from the program, so much so that I decided this year to give back and also help out other first years. And for me, the experience has been that one of growth, both personally and professionally. My first year at UWC being online seems like a very daunting experience. However, through signing up for the mentor program that UWC offers, I was provided with support, a group of friends that were within my faculty, as well as a mentor who guided me through my new journey at this university. I'm forever grateful for all the help my mentor has given me, support, and loving, caring advice to help us go th get through our first year. Hi, my name is Sophia Bata. The first year experience program has taught me a lot, from motivation to study planning. Thanks to my amazing mentor, Colette, these sessions have become sessions that I look forward to every week. Uh, especially the coward games have made the experience even more amazing. I definitely did not regret signing up Thank you for having this program. It definitely helped me with my first year experience online. The first year mentoring program has helped me with the transition from high school to university by teaching me that in order to stay on par with my lectures, I need to follow a structured timetable as well as plan my day so that there's minimal procrastination happening. Um, it's also taught me how to interact and communicate with my peers since this is something I would need to be doing once I complete my degree. It's helped the transition phase seem a lot less stressful and I'm thankful for this. Good day to one and all. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank all the mentors who are part of the FYTP program at the University of West Cape. 
I am a first year student who is a mentee who is part of the program and I'd like to thank each and everyone who took the time to help us as mentees to conquer our problems to cope with being a first year student. Before I joined the program, I didn't know how to manage my time. I didn't know how to tackle my problems, but ever since I joined the program, it has helped me so much. That our sessions we have each week really helps me to recharge, to feel that I'm not alone in this, to not think about studies for that hour and just think about something else, learn something new, learn new skills. So that really helped me and I encourage everyone to do it. My mentor, the words of her mouth flows like a running ocean. Her boldness is more that of a lion. Her voice is fallacious and so attractive, having vision of great leadership. You made me realize that whatever difficulty we face, in this world we must continue with the pace. Letting no problem impend us in any case. I and the others admire your attitude in rendering support with gratitude that made hard work become light accomplishing our academics with delight through my mentorship experience i have discovered many things about myself you encouraged me not to be scared to face a challenge don't limit your challenges challenge your limits they said i am who i am because you helped me realize what i am capable of Oh, colleagues, every time I watched that, I get goosebumps. It was really, really great to engage with these students. We used a lot of social media to connect with our students. But anyway, moving on from that, um, I would just like to very quickly highlight in the short space of time that I have, uh, our engagement as a, a partner in the Sia Pumalela project and also Sia Pumalela's uh, support uh, in, the, in the past year. All the workshops that we attended, whether it was a partner service workshop or a workshops organized by Sia Pumalela, it actually helped us to conceptualize and structure our program. So basically we followed uh, a five-step uh, um, approach when we uh, looked at any kind of uh, problem that we wanted to address, any problem we wanted to look at, and also looking at our previous uh, student success projects uh, initiatives. Uh, we did have initiatives prior to joining Zia Pumalela, but what actually uh, um, helped us is that we were now able to structure it in a more uh, um, more formative way to assist in not only uh, uh, monitoring and evaluating the project, but more looking at data and how data informs what we do and how we enhance our programs that we initially had. So the five phases that we look at, the first one is about collecting and protecting high quality data. Uh, we realize that data is very, very important when you initiate any program or even to monitor and evaluate the program, you have to do it against the data that you actually uh, collect. So uh, the data workshop that we attended by Sia Pumalela helped us to do that. Also the formation of the uh, data Analyt analytics working group, which was mentioned by the DVC, that was important. And then also the development of our uh, data um, ethical use policy that's coming up. We're still uh, busy working on that. So that is important. And the final one is the data inventory. What we've noticed in our year one is that we had data uh, uh, situated all over the university in pockets. And the first thing we needed to do was bring all the data together in, in order to look at what data we have and how can we use that data collectively? And stage two or step two is making meaning from the data. And that was important for us to appoint data analysts. We actually was under-resourced in this area and the data analyst uh, runs capacity uh, workshops, data capacity workshops with staff in order to unpack uh, uh, data. We also 
uh, purchased a few uh, tools in order to assist and also to look at narratives as well. It's important to look both at quantitative and qualitative uh, data. The third step is socializing results with campus community. And that's very, very important. Here, our student success committee that we formed in year one, the Sia Pomalela Student Success Committee has 30 members and the members are from uh, across the institution, all faculties and major units in the institution forms the student success committee. Also campus workshops created spaces for discussion of our uh, results that we would usually bring out from the data we collect. Step four then is moving from data to action. And this is actually, situ we kind of situate the data in the context, depending on which areas we want to focus on. And I'm, I'm going to pick up on, on this uh, uh, area, moving from data to action in a, in a slide further down. Uh, we've actually got 10 projects that we look at, and I will just outline those projects later on. And then finally, in year three, we're going to go into evaluation, although monitoring is happening continuously throughout. But in our year three, our focus is going to be on the monitoring and evaluation and looking at data in that area. So how, when, and what in the project plan will be monitored and evaluated uh, throughout our milestone period. Uh, if we go on to the next slide, we were very excited about the ICAT, uh, which is the Institutional Capacity Assessment Tool that we had to uh, initiate in year one. We had a very good response rate. Uh, 561 uh, staff members completed that uh, survey, which was really great. But I think more important than just completing the survey was the Capacity Cafe workshops that were run where we actually discussed uh, the findings that we got from, from, from the survey. And uh, three capacity areas that we looked at was teaching and learning, policy and practice, and data and technology. And within those three areas, three questions were asked to the participants in the Capacity Cafe workshop. The first one was to look at where our strengths in this capacity area lies. Then possible reasons for the high percentage of don't knows. Uh, a lot of participants actually ticked the don't know uh, choice when it came to answering the questions in the different capacity. So we wanted to unpack that and try and find reasons for that. And the last one was what needs to be strengthened to support students in this capacity area. So if you look at teaching and learning, the strengths we look at, and I'm not going to go through that in detail, we have three bullets there. Uh, many of them spoke about easy access to lecturers. Lectures were always available to answer questions. And this was uh, mainly during uh, uh, the um, COVID period. And then the students support the mentorship program, the tutoring program actually supported uh, students during the COVID period and also our mental health and wellness services that we provided for them. Uh, policy and practice, our strengths, the, many of them mention that we have good policies and these policies are based on good practice, it's good guidelines, and our mental health and wellness policy was inclusive. We've just concluded the um, mental health and wellness policy last year, so people were talking about that and they liked the process that was followed in order to uh, finalize our policy. Looking at data and technology, a lot of them acknowledge the provision of data and devices during the COVID period to both staff and students, access to the Wi-Fi, and then our uh, learner management system called Ikamba. Uh, they felt that was really good to connect with staff and students. And then the new tracking system for marks and assessments as well. Possible uh, reasons for the high percentage of don't knows. Uh, the discussions that we had in each of the capacity areas uh, had very similar themes. So therefore I've actually written it across. A lot of them said uh, possible reasons why uh, participants had clicked, uh, ticked the don't know box could be due to the lack of communication, uh, could be lack of knowledge on strategies, lack of understanding of process and actions, et cetera, all at institutional level, uh, disengagement with the institution, 
working in silos and also no voice. So a lot of this, uh, we realized that uh, staff members usually work in their unit and uh, in their area, and they're not aware of what's happening around them. Uh, what needs to be strengthened in teaching and learning, they spoke about more staff, uh, student engagement and also more key stakeholder engagement. They spoke about streamlining registration for students and also streamlining student choices uh, and the uh, choice pro process. Also about providing students with fundamental skills besides just academic skills. Literacy skills, it's about providing them with fundamental skills. Under policy and practice, they uh, spoke about what needs to be strengthened is discussion of ideas prior to implementation, uh, sharing information, being more open, more consultation, and they felt new policies should be involved, uh, uh, staff should be involved from grassroots level upwards. And uh, data and technology, what needs to be strengthened is the limitation to track inactive and active students, uh, more information on BI and student outcomes, and uh, stats on student completion rate and graduation rate and success as well. So we've used this to actually move on and try and bring this into our program. And therefore, we had to make changes to our initial uh, Cia goals that we had our project in order to uh, try and accommodate findings from the ICAT. Moving from data to actions, like I mentioned earlier to you, I have highlighted 10 uh, programs or initiatives that has been uh, uh, implemented. The orientation program, the transition program, the mentoring program, high priority modules, the tutor enhancement program, making your mark is uh, looking at second and senior year experience, curriculum advising, staff capacity workshops, the early warning system and the study exam body. Most of these actions are presently ongoing and uh, student success we've seen goes beyond then your hard outcomes where we look at uh, academic uh, performance, retention rates, attrition rates, uh, throughput rates, uh, we felt we should be fo focusing more on the soft outcomes that students uh, uh, um, uh, reach or students achieve as they go through each of these programs. Uh, finally, lessons learned from uh, our engagement with uh, Asia Pumalela is uh, four areas we're looking at, student voices, and we noticed with much of the data that we've been collecting, it's quantitative data, and not much student voices uh, are, are shown in the quantitative data, so we need to collect qualitative data through interviews uh, to get student voices. As, you, uh, as you've seen earlier, we've also had videos, we've also allowed them to express themselves in artwork and poetry as well. Uh, in order to understand what students are going through. Student partnerships is a big thing for us, and especially in co-curricular uh, co activities. Uh, usually we have students as tutors in the curricula, uh, but co-curricular, we've realized that they're playing a very important role. So the transition program is by students, for students, and they work as partners with staff in order to conceptualize the program and the content of the program as well. Our last two lessons learned came from our ICAT survey, which spoke about communication and collaboration, two important areas that we are working hard on to try and change that working in silos and uh, involving the university community. Thank you, colleagues. Thank you, Sue. I think you've passed that presentation with flying colors, judging by the endorsements on the chat, both in your application of uh, ICAT, as well as the use of student voices. There's a question here. Um, how did you achieve such a high staff response to the 38% in the ICAT assessment tool? Okay, yeah, that was really great. great. We, we uh, started uh, communicating with staff very early, we had uh, a video uh, that we made from the DVC academic, 
explaining the importance of the ICAT uh, and how it would support us as an institution to move forward. So we had that video sent out to uh, staff on uh, UWC communication. And then we also sent out newsletters. Uh, we engaged with them for Q&A if anybody needed to know about that. So a, a month or so went on with just uh, creating an awareness of ICAT and the importance of ICAT. So when the, and also we sent out a, a video on how to. Uh, so when you get the link, what needs to be done, step one, step two, step three, which actually made it very easy for them. Uh, when the ICAT survey came about, we had it opened for uh, three weeks. And within that three weeks, every uh, uh, once a week, we would send out communication as well. So I think that's how we really got uh, our staff on board. And I think, like I mentioned, more important than just getting the results, it was sharing the results with the university community and with all 561 participants as well to get the results back. And then the Capacity Cafe workshops was really informative. Thanks, Sue. Another question here, Sue, before you go from Tasneem, have you seen an improvement in student performance through these initiatives? And do you know the improvement quantum? Yeah, we, we weren't measuring uh, student performance, but we, uh, like I mentioned, we're looking at more soft outcomes than us, uh, hard outcomes. So we've noticed more students uh, uh, seeking help. If we look at support services, more students going to CSSS for a psychosocial kind of support, more students uh, making use of the library, uh, the writing center, and those numbers we are looking at actually increase. Even the students socializing, engaging with their lecturers, engaging with their tutors. So that's what we're seeing at the moment, as opposed to looking at pass rates. It's very hard to link the pass rate academic performance uh, to that. But what we can say is what we notice is that uh, retention uh, rates has increased and we're hoping it's because of the program for first year. Thanks, Sue. I'm going to take on the last question here before we close, and that's from Teboho, who asks, what process do you use to evaluate the impact of first year experience, the mentorship program, or other programs such as your tutorship and your buddy programs? With the mentorship program, uh, both we evaluate the program at the end of each term. Uh, mentees will fill out an evaluation form but uh, mentors and the first year transition officers, all of which are students, would usually write narrative reports. So we, we usually look at those and we would then adjust the program for the following term. So we have to take it term by term and uh, be intentional looking at what do students need now? How can we help them now? So those evaluation forms becomes very important for us to then adjust and work towards students' need in the in the following term. Great. Thank you, Sue. And as you can see, everyone's echoing such great, inspiring presentations to start off our Wednesday morning. And I thank you all. I thank all the participants. And um, I'm leaving you now with a three-minute comfort break before we go off into our concurrent sessions. So thank you very much, Sue and Ku from DUT and UWC. Thank you so much.